My name is Walter Edwards, I'm the director of the United Center. I'm delighted that uh, even though the weather is so bad, that so many of you are able to come. I'm sure that many people stay away from campus today with the expectation that the university would close. And, um, otherwise, uh, the audience would be much larger. But uh, I thank you all for, for, for coming. Um, Give a short introduction to Professor Norman Duncan before. Uh, he is an associate professor uh, and associate chair of the Department of, uh, of Music here at Penn State University. He's also the area coordinator for the organ performance uh, program at the university. Additionally, he directs the State University of Colorado and coordinates many of the, the, the core concerts presented by the music department. Uh, Professor Duncan received his undergraduate degree in English literature from the University of Detroit. And then he came here to the State University and earned a Master of Fine Arts degree in organ performance. And then he decided to go to the flagship university, uh, the University of Michigan, where he earned a degree uh, in church music and public performance. He is a Detroit original, somebody who is right, right here from in our midst and who has done us extremely proud. Uh, he is a multifaceted musician. Uh, as an artist, he has performed extensively in both the United States and, and Europe. Recently, he performed uh, organ recitals in Trier, Germany, and Sydney, Australia. As a liturgical musician, he served as the music director for the Cathedral of the Most Blessed Sacrament, one of the premier uh, churches in this area. And he did that for over 26 years both planning and directing music for both major um, archdiocesan liturgies and local parish celebrations. He is the second longest serving Catholic or cathedral musician in the country. Among his greatest achievements is uh, as a liturgical musician was as director of music for the historic visit of Pope John Paul II to Detroit in 1987. He, is a, he established uh, the Gregorian Institute of Detroit for the study of Gregorian chants. He has presented papers on the church of music at the international congresses in Rome, Dublin, and for the Diocese of Ungu in, in Nigeria, and also the Archdiocese of Abuja in Nigeria. As a consultant, he has been on the editorial review board for the Oregon Catholic Press, and is present uh, a member of the Music Review Committee for the revision of that important uh, anthology, Lead Me, Guide Me which is the African American Catholic Kingdom. He's also a member of the Education Board of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. As a core director, Professor Duncan has presented major concerts under the Catholic Cultural Series with the <coughs> Archdiocesan Chorus, and has collaborated in concerts with the Wayne State University Choral and Ensembles, the uh, Brazil and our choral ensemble and the Detroit Symphony Civic Orchestra. In both 2004 and 2005, he directed the Michigan Youth of Royal Ensemble at the Carnegie Hall in New York City. He is a recipient of the Award for Excellence for Music Direction from the American College Theatre Festival, Washington, D.C and Sister Thea Bowman Award of the Archdiocese of Detroit. The Spirit of Detroit Award, the Mother, the Mother Teresa Duchin Award for Exemplary Community Service, and this year was, he was the first recipient of the 
Changing Lives to Music Award presented to him by Ann Parsons, by Ann Parsons, president of the Detroit City Orchestra. In spite of his celebrity and his very busy schedule, Professor Duncan has found time to be a friend of the Humanity Center, and for this I am absolutely grateful. His name on our programs has added distinction and recognition. This is in fact his seventh consecutive Brumbaugh talk, which continues a streak which he began in 2003. Today he is talking to us and he's lecturing to us and performing for us. It is a lecture recital on the musical legacy of Moses Hogan, whose lifespan on this earth was between 1957 and 2003. So with this very brief, uh, uh, this brief abbreviated introduction, I would ask you to welcome to the podium and to the concert performance, Professor Nora Duncan Ford. Joseph Jobert, his friend, had not heard from Moses for over a week 
So, unable to reach him, got on a plane and flew to New Orleans. He called Brazil from New Orleans and confirmed rumors that Moses was greatly ill. That Friday, I received a call from his manager informing me that Moses had an inoperable and cancerous brain tumor and that he, had, he was not expected to survive. My first reaction was disbelief. This promising, talented, handsome black man was dying. I called the chair of the music department at that time, Dennis Tini. He suggested that we just go on with the plans that we had laid out, which also included a clinic for high school students. I then called Brazil Denard, who suggested I do the same. <coughs> First of all, I had to contact the 10 schools we had invited. To my surprise, there, were, there was not one cancellation. All 315 students from 10 schools in West Detroit attended the high school festival, as did everyone scheduled to perform in the concert Sunday afternoon. Things went on as planned, but without Moses Holden. I continued to get news from Brazil about Moses' decline in health. His family, not knowing of Moses' success or his impact on the world of choral music, simply did not say much of anything about what was going on. But on February the, 20, February the 11th, rather, 2003, at the start of the American Choral Directors Association's National Convention in New York City, an event which we had talked about attending, Moses succumbed to cancer. There was no big funeral, no fanfare, rather only a simple gravesite service attended by his friends and a few of the original members of his famous ensemble. A simple end for a man from simple beginnings. Moses was born in March of 1957 in New Orleans. And he attended the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts, a regional pre-professional arts training center, much like the Flint Institute that we have here in the state of Michigan, which offered students instruction in music, theater arts, visual arts, creative writing, dance, and media arts. It was founded in 1973 by a group of educators, business leaders, community activists, and artists who saw the need for an institution which would be devoted to the development of young talent in that area. Graduates included uh, Terrence Blatcher, who's been here at Wayne State University, jazz musician, Mary Catherine Harrison, and the, the famous Marcello brothers, Clinton and Branford. Later on, he attended the Oberlin Conservatory of Music and the Juilliard School of Music and finally, the Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. He was a consummate pianist and won several prestigious uh, competitions in that particular area. Starting off as a pianist, in 1980, he began to explore the choral music media. The result was the arrangements and publications of mostly spirituals which are now part of the standard repertoire of professional, church, college, community, and high school choirs around the world. This is what Logan had to say about spirituals. Spirituals, he says, he said, contain a lyrical quality and dealt with a variety of emotions. The songs were termed spirituals because of the relationship between the type of song and the Holy Spirit. Having evolved with the human, inhuman conditions of slavery, Spirituals were consistently employed in the quest for freedom, but also, Moses added, in religious services and to educate, reprimand, signal, or to aid in storytelling. They functioned as a means of education, educating slaves about their own affairs. Why spirituals? Again, the Detroit connection. It was Brazil Denard who strongly encouraged him to follow the tradition of H.T. Burley. Paul Johnson, and even himself, Brazil Denard. And so he turned to spirituals. So the next thing that Moses had to do was organize a professional ensemble. Eventually, the ensemble was named the Moses Hogan Chorale to promote this music and the spirituals, thus following in the tradition of the Fisk Jubilee Singers of Fisk University, the Hall Johnson Negro Choir, the Tuskegee Singers and the Brazil Denard Singers, or the Brazil Denard Chorale. It made its debut in 1998 
on the recording with the soprano, uh, Barbara Hendricks. Now, what was it like being a member of this ensemble? Richard Sharif, a good friend of mine from New Orleans, knew Moses Hogan early in his career. He was one of the founding members of this professional touring ensemble. This is what he recalled about uh, his father's memories <coughs> as a member of his ensemble. This is Richard talking. So, Nora, I'm happy that you're doing your part to keep alive the contributions of a great composer. I feel my participation in the Moses Hogan Chorale was the highlight musical experience of my life. I remember the very first rehearsal I attended. For one hour, we worked on one phrase of one song, singing very softly the entire time. The vocal blend was phenomenal. It was amazing to receive the handwritten scores at rehearsal, only because to pass up the scores to receive an updated, edited version at the next rehearsal. This process occurred often until Moses felt that everything was right. One time, we were headed to Des Moines, Iowa to perform. We had a connecting flight in St. Louis, Missouri. It was there, in the St. Louis airport, that Moses passed out the first version of the commissioned work, Great Day. We sight read it there in the airport, where crowds of people simply stopped to listen. We got a thunderous applause. I'll never forget the reaction of the crowd members to how awesome the arrangement was. We practiced one more time in the morning where we performed it. Elijah Rock was our signature finale. However, I remember how excited Moses was when he passed out the initial score of the Battle of Jericho. I remember him saying that it would replace the right rock as a crowd pleaser. I'm not sure if it does, but it certainly provides a separate punch. I don't know if I was more excited about singing with a group that performed intricate pieces in nine part harmony, or that I obtained a great appreciation of the spirituals from the experience. Moses brought a live, unique style that was truly black and American. On a personal note, Laura, Moses had a wonderful sense of humor. He joked with everyone and about everything, yet he was absolutely professional in his presentation, which we all felt obligated to follow. The spirituals, just a little note about the spirituals. The spirituals are one of the largest bodies of American folk songs to survive into the 21st century, which are known and performed, said before, throughout the world. From African origin, they originally were sung in unison by slaves and churches. And the typical form is this alternation between uh, the soloist and the uh, singers who sing the refrain. There's the influence of the Isaac Watts hymns of the 19th, early 19th century, uh, which were very popular among uh, blacks and others uh, in church services, and they definitely did influence spirituals. The texts of the spirituals range from sorrow songs, like some of the ones we'll hear today, Sometimes I Feel, or He Never Said a Mummy Word, or Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? These singers identifying with Jesus Christ as a liberator. The theme of death is found in many of them, although historian Miles Mark Fisher maintains that virtually all spirituals were codified songs of protest, Deep River, Dillaway, incitements, that is, to escape from slavery. The Fisk Jubilee Singers of Fisk University, founded in 1871, began this tradition that eventually was picked up by Moses Hogan to uh, bring to the world uh, the music of African Americans, and particularly the music of the spirituals. In the 20th century, the spirituals moved more into the concert hall, but declined in churches. And as you know now, they've been replaced primarily by gospel music. So that's all I'm going to say about Moses and spirituals. Now let's get ground to doing what I wanted to do in the first place, to perform. <laughs> so, our performances will be in, in, actually in two parts. The first part will consist of students from the Boise University Concert Chorale singing the a solo spiritual arrangements by Moses Hogan. And that will be followed by Concert Chorale in its entirety joining me on stage and singing about four selections from Moses Hogan's so rather extensive choral spiritual arrangements. So, without any further uh, delay, uh, we will begin with our first soloist. Zachos.
Somebody's knocking. Somebody's knocking.
gonna sing to the spirit moves in my heart I'm gonna sing to the spirit moves in my heart I'm gonna sing to the spirit moves in my heart I'm gonna sing till Jesus comes I'm gonna sing to the Jesus moves in my heart I'm gonna sing to the Jesus moves in my heart I'm gonna sing to the Jesus moves in my heart